Father, we just give you thanks. We just give you thanks, really, for who you are. For the fact that you are God. And Lord, as we've prayed that, uh, and, and, and sung that we enthrone you, Lord, I want to ask for chains to be broken in our thinking as we go through your word. Lord, for us to actually be set free into the new hope and the new life of living for you as we look at your word. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, good morning. Good morning. Sorry, I need to... Sorry, I needed a quick uh, drink. Well, who was here last week? So that was part one, wasn't it, of our teaching on 1 Corinthians chapter 8, uh, right through to 11 verse 1. So we're in part two. Yay. Who's eaten food, sacrificed to idols this week, or did you abstain? Because you wasn't sure. Okay, that's fine. What was the key lesson that we learned last time? Who can remember really the key lesson? I know one of you in this room learned that key lesson because you quoted it back to me this week when you spoke to me. So it's not about me, it's the other people. That's right, it's not about me, it's about those in the room. So who's with us? It's not about uh, the Corinthians and their rights. Remember the Corinthians believe in demanding their rights. Doesn't sound any different from us today, does it? You're all sitting there going, oh no, no, I don't demand my rights. Oh yes, we do. And it was looking at uh, the key thing that Paul's trying to get at is food sacrifice to idols. Because in Corinth, there's lots of pagan temples everywhere. And um, the key issue was, what looked like the key issue was, there were some of the super spiritual, super intelligent, we know that we can eat all food because it all belongs to God. Whether it's been sacrificed and honored to an idol or not is irrelevant because we know better. And we can eat at these, uh, these festivals and we can eat the food there and it's not a problem. And Paul's saying, well, there are some there with weaker consciences within the fellowship and people who don't know Jesus yet who don't know that. And you're actually making your fellow believers stumble when they see you eating idol food. And then we went through chapter 9, which I said was the slab of meat in between the sandwich that shows an ethic of how we should interact with each other and how we should be. It's not about me. It's about who's in the room. Just because I know something's okay, I may have other 10 other brothers and sisters with me who don't know yet. So when they see me doing something that I know is okay... I could be causing them real damage to their consciences. I could give them agony to battle over all week because they don't know it's okay yet. So when they do it or they see me doing it and they do it, they might feel really guilty and feel condemned by it. At which point most of us say, well, we just teach them then. But sometimes with all of us, it takes time. So it's not about us. It's about who's in the room with us. So we're going to continue the teaching. And we're going to look at chapter 9, verses right through to chapter 11, verse 1. Come on, get excited. And remember, it was said only last week, whatever I say goes. Wasn't that right, Carol? Right. So, <laughs> Gina, I've marked that down as one of my key moments in my life. I, this is good for humour. Right. So, it's not just about food sacrifice to idols. Never was. It's part of the whole package here for Paul that he's trying to unpack with the Corinthians and about the way they think. 
So if you remember at the back end of uh, chapter 9, uh, Paul says, I want to be like anybody else. I want to try and become like other people so I can win them to Christ. So if I have to give up my rights, my freedom, so that somebody else comes to Christ, that is more important than me. You with me so far? So let's carry on. So 24 to 27. Don't you realize in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize. So run to win. And don't come up on the screen. So run to win. Yeah, it's not going to the next verse. This is my problem. So anyway, run fast, not slow like the computer. Goodness me, what's happened to that today? Okay, scrap the computer. That really, can you read that okay, everyone up there? It's, um, <laughs> you might need some binoculars at this one. <laughs> Don't you realize that in a race, everyone, so we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 24 to 27. So just use uh, your Bibles in front of you. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. Don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize. So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I am not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. Paul's fear, and a real fear, is that the church at Corinth have become somewhat overconfident in its spirituality and its knowledge. It sort of feels that it's free to partake or take part in any religious or cultural activity without there being any real spiritual repercussions because they've been set free in Christ and they know that everything they do belongs to the Lord and they, they've sort of got this fact that some of them have become super spiritual, super knowledgeable and they're becoming overconfident in that. Sort of we are free in Christ and they're free, free from death. Uh, we have salvation and Paul is saying, yeah, that's all that's true, but that can, can lead us to a life of somewhat complacency if it's born out of knowledge. Remember one of the other key things we learned last week? It's not about knowing about God, it's knowing God. There's a distinct difference. And as Stott put it, as one commentator, a person in Christ cannot lose their salvation, but they can find their service for Christ has become, sorry, that their service for Christ has been followed through with their own resources and for their own glory. And that is what supremely Paul feared the most. And so he has really got to this point in thinking that the Corinthians, they can't lose their salvation. We know that right from the beginning. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, you are sanctified now. Yes, remember that? You are now God's holy person. If you're in Christ, God loves you. You're in him. You are sanctified. You are saved. That is your present status today. Isn't that right, Pat? You are today. And not just Pat, by the way. <laughs> Anybody here knows Jesus, including me. That's a miracle. So you are sanctified today. That's not his problem. But the problem was we can lead into a life of, because we know that, Paul's fear for the Corinthians is complacency starts kicking in. It's not about you, it's who's in the room with you. I mean, Paul couldn't have wrote Romans chapter 8. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Yeah? If he believed that you could lose your salvation just like that. That is not true. But what Paul is saying is, he, when he quotes this, I want to finish this race well. Do you remember um, right at the beginning, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he was talking about what kind of building of a church 
Will it be gold, silver and jewels or will it be with wood, hay and straw? That's the reference he's getting at. Now here at that chapter, at that moment, he's talking about leaders and talking about pastors and what sort of church they want to see built. Is it one built on wood, hay and straw, which is their own resources? Or is it gold, silver and gems, which is all built on Jesus Christ and his resources? So he's saying, I know I can't lose my salvation here, but you Corinthians, don't you realize you need to run this race well? Not complacency. So Paul is using uh, basically what we consider to be the Olympics, but it's the other. In Corinth, there was the Isthma Games, and I can't pronounce it. Look it up yourself. It's Ithmian Games. Thank you. And um, it was a bian- uh, sorry every two-year event that's almost like it was one of four. So the Olympic Games, consider that, but it's one of four, and it happens every two years in Corinth. And Paul's probably got that very much in mind when he's thinking about running the race and looking at athletes at his time. Well, athletes were quite interesting because they would have to exercise extreme self-control in keeping themselves fit, yeah? Which, by the way, self-control is a fruit of the spirit, isn't it? So that's an interesting uh, comment that Paul is making. And athletes would need to... uh, Well, when he's got here, excuse me, when he's got here, the Greek word disciplining their training is really defined as to keep one's emotions, impulses or desires under control. Control oneself, abstain. That's actually the Greek version of that word. He's actually saying it's not just about the physical body, because the Greek he's deliberately using here is about actually keeping your emotions, your impulses, your desires all under control, controlling oneself. Abstaining comes back to that thing about giving up your freedom. It's not about you. It's about who's in the room. And an athlete here in these times would have self-abstained from sexual relations and their diet. And what have we been learning so far in Corinthians? Sexual immorality and food. Paul's very good, isn't he? Wrapped it up. I just thought we used to think, oh, he's talking about athletes. But it's not until you actually understand the backdrop of their understanding of what they did back then. Ah, so they didn't have sex and they watched what their diet was. I know, you know, the diet. It's good. Problem was that the Corinthians were becoming spiritually flabby. They wanted the rewards, they wanted the blessings, but without the hard work. They almost wanted to stroll the Christian journey. And Paul is saying, no, run it with all your might. Give up on some stuff. Diet well. Train your body. Don't be complacent. So just think for a minute for an athlete. Know any athletes? The funny bit? Oh, you want to know the funny bit, is it, Carol? All right, Carol wants to know the funny bit, everyone. The funny bit, all the athletes, you know, when they ran, they were naked. It's true, there's no... They literally stripped... So you know when Paul uses the imagery about throwing off every kind of sin to keep running? It's the same imagery. Be completely bare to run the race for Christ. If anybody ever gets up at the church here and says, you want to do, strip, just ignore them. It's not of God, okay? Exactly. <laughs> it is. But in reality, that's what they did. So it goes to prove in 2,000 years how we've twisted some of the imagery of the body that you can't do that in the Olympic Games now because people will just find it too difficult to deal with. No, 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 but you think about it. But back then they wouldn't have seen it as anything other than the person she's running naked. I just thought... Yeah. They let it... They did whatever they wanted to do. Moving on, quickly, before that gets worse. The problem is, reading that, we then suddenly get this image in our head about running the race, the Christian walk, is it's got to be constant, at full pelt, every day, all of the time. Yeah, you think about an athlete. He's using that imagery. 
that they're running the race, running to win the prize. So you might wake up every morning thinking, oh, if I've not done enough today for God, and if I've not done it at the end of the day, I've not run my race hard enough for God. Do you, do you get that imagery? I mean, I can't quite sort of put running because I can't run for tuppence. Swimming, on the other hand, that imagery I get. Now, when I go swimming, and I've sort of recently re-returned back to my regime of discipline of swimming, I could go swimming every day, except for Sundays, without fail. And I could swim and swim up and down the pool, and I'm not being boastful, but I am in the fast lane. That's where I swim. Doesn't mean I'm the fastest, but I am in the fast lane. So I, you know, know how to swim. My parents forced me to go when I was about seven or eight or nine, something like that, and forever I am grateful. <laughs> Hi, Mum. So, <laughs> but I am truly grateful. So, I can swim up and down and keep going. Right? But guess what I discovered? You get slower and slower and slower each day if you don't give your body a rest. If I don't give my body a rest, if I don't take a day's break from swimming to allow my muscles to recuperate, to allow me just to relax and get my energy levels back up, I'm not as fast the next day and the next day. Do you see it with me? And that's the same with the athletes and the same with our Christian walk. It's not about always at running at full pelt because there are times that you have to take a rest. You have to sort of come off the treadmill, get out of the pool, whatever imagery you like, and take a rest. That's why we have Sabbath day once every six days. It's God ordained it. You've got to take a rest. So you don't have to be running at full pelt every day, all day. During those days, you have what you can be as rest period. So if you feel condemned that you're not running at full pelt for God every moment and you're not doing it all of the time, you're meant to take a rest. You with me? Get the imagery? But the problem is, with the Corinthians, they were probably taking too much rest and becoming flabby spiritually. When I took too much time off swimming, that's why I wear waistcoats, it's a good corset. <gasps> I become more flabby. If you take too much time out and not quite walking the race you should be walking with God, you become spiritually flabby. This is Paul's point. This is what he's worried about. The Corinthians have started falling into this trap of not of lacking self-restraint. They've started to get very chilled and relaxed in their spirituality. They think they can do just about anything and God will forgive them. They were starting to not question some of the things that they were doing. He said, you've got to have purpose in mind. You've got to win, run to win the prize. When the athletes run, they would get a laurel thing of parsley and it was rotten and it was nearly gone and it would be gone within a few days Yet they were trained for months and months and years just so they could win that that one prize so that they could be paraded through the streets that one year for that one day but we're running a race that's going to give us an internal prize that we're going to be running through the streets of heaven forever amen So you've got to run with purpose, run for the focus, run for the goal. And he's also saying, I'm not shadow boxing. Now, I'm not a boxer. Closest I get to boxing is putting something in a box and then sealing it. I am no boxer, but he's talking about shadow boxing. And my understanding is shadow boxing is you're there and you're looking in the mirror or something or at the shadow. In their case, it would have been a shadow sort of. And you're sort of looking at your moves and you're sparring. Well, in real shadow, you know, you're not just putting shadow boxing, you're really just punching it in the air. You're not actually hitting anything, are you? And he's saying, well, you can't run this race or walk this Christ-like race aimlessly, just going, oh, yeah, I'll just whack over there. Oh, hello, Jesus loves you, whoever you are in the atmosphere over there, or whatever else. You've got to have a purpose. God created us all for a purpose, amen? It's part of his salvation plan. The main purpose is relationship with him. And with each other. So sometimes we've got to have a purpose in mind. 
can't just aimlessly get up every morning and get complacent. So just before you think Paul is um, worried about this, and he's saying, I'm doing it because after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. Now, he's not talking about losing his salvation. He's talking about disqualified from receiving the crown of a good and faithful servant who's done exactly what God wanted him to do. We're all going to be saved, but there is clear evidence in Matthew, etc., that it seems to be almost not a reward point system in heaven, but there is this sort of, you know, God will give out certain rewards to people. Don't know what that looks like. One thing, we're all saved. If you know Jesus, you're saved. But do you want to finish the race well? I know when I get out swimming, I want to get out and go, yes, I feel good. Man, I look good. And I feel good. I can feel good because the muscles are all tense right now. In about five minutes, they'll soften up again. But that's fine. But I want to swim the race. I want to beat the guy in front of me. I want to overtake him. I'm a little bit competitive, I admit. But I want to be able to get to heaven, and I want God to say to me, well done, good and faithful servant. So then Paul then looks into, and we're going to look at it now, chapter 10, verses 1 to 13. Examples of those who became complacent. I don't want you to forget, dear brothers and sisters, about our ancestors in the wilderness long ago. All of them were guided by a cloud that moved ahead of them, and all of them walked through the sea on dry ground. In the cloud and in the sea, all of them were baptized as followers of Moses. All of them ate the same spiritual food, and all of them drank the same spiritual water. For they drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with them, and that rock was Christ. Yet God was not pleased with most of them, and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. These things happened as a warning to us, so that we would not crave evil things as they did, or worship idols of some of them did. As the scriptures say, the people celebrated with feasting and drinking, and they indulged in pagan revelry. And we must not engage in sexual immorality as some of them did, causing 23,000 of them to die in one day. Nor should we put Christ to the test as some of them did, then died from snake bites. And don't grumble as some of them did, and then we were destroyed by the angel of death. These things happened as examples for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. If you think you are standing strong, be careful not to fall. The temptations in your life are no different from the other experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. Paul has gone back to the Old Testament. If you may remember, I always said throughout the whole of the letter of Corinthians, Paul is always trying to give the bigger perspective to the Corinthian church. And part of that was looking at the Old Testament, what we consider to be the Old Testament. To look back at the salvation history that God does working with his people. So he's looking back at the Israelites and the Exodus moment, the moment that they came out of Egypt, what we would now consider sort of Israelites, redemption moment. And he's looking back at that with them and saying, here is an example of those who become complacent with God after he has released them. So we're going to look at some of those stories in a moment. But I want you to note this. As Siampa says, in this passage, Paul uses the Israelites' experience of redemption, idolatry, and destruction as a prism through which the Corinthians are to understand their own situation. So he's using the lens of the Old Testament example of what happened to the Israelites for the Corinthians to see what's going on with them. Notice this still order, by the way. Redemption, idolatry, destruction. Note the order. It's not the other way around. It's not destruction, 
idolatry, and then, oh, redu- redemption. It is they've been redeemed first, but somehow they fell into idolatry. That then caused their downfall and destruction. Hmm. So what's Paul talking about? What's he talking about in the cloud and in the sea? All of them were baptized as follower of Moses. All of them ate the same spiritual food and all of them drank from the same spiritual water. Well, he's looking back and he's saying the spiritual water could be the Red Sea. The food is that of God. He's sort of using the spiritual. Because don't forget the Corinthians think they're super spiritual. They got it all sorted. And he's saying, well, look at the Israelites then. They used this spiritual food. They had the same. And also they had real food that came from heaven. They got provided for in the physical food as well, supernaturally. Stop put it. That Paul's using in both historical epochs, there are two events which are pregnant with meaning. Being baptised to denote loyalty to God's appointed leader and being provided with supernatural food and drink on a regular basis. He's using both imagery. From Moses, they were baptised into following Moses, and then the Corinthians now are baptised into following Jesus. Problem is with the Corinthians, they've become so absorbed with their rights that they were now presuming on the results of their relationship with God just to see them through all of the time. Ah, I know Jesus. I can do whatever I want. Almost they had a right to demand things and a lifestyle for themselves as they wanted. And then so Paul's saying, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's look about the history of our ancestors. Oh, you may not be Israelites now. You might be Gentiles. But because of your following of Christ and your following of God, they are your ancestors in the spiritual sense. Yeah? You have connected back to the Israelites. They are part of your history. So you need to look at how God dealt with them to understand your own situation. So let's look at some of those examples just for a moment, what they did. If you want to, you can turn with me or you can just let me uh, do a lot of the um, turning. Put that marker back in there. Exodus 32. Verse 6. But we're going back to Corinthians, so keep your fingers in there. Here's an example of presuming that you're okay. The people got up early the next morning to sacrifice burnt offerings and peace offerings. That's to Yahweh, to God. After this, they celebrated with feasting and drinking and indulged in pagan revelry. Pagan revelry is not going down and partying with the mates at a birthday party down a hall or down a pub or down a nightclub. Pagan revelry is indulging in sexual practices as a worship to a pagan god. But it's almost done me early morning prayers. I've done me bit for God. Done me 15 minutes reading me word life scripture. Done me prayer. In the name of Jesus, amen. Right, what can I do for the rest of the day? It's all mine. I'm sorted with God. Yeah, do you get the point? That's the modern day version. Exodus 17, verses 1 to 2. Please recognize this. The Israelites have been saved by God. They've been brought out of slavery, that they've been oppressed in 400 years. They're out. And this is how they end up reacting after a while. At the Lord's command, the whole community of Israel left the wilderness of Sinai and they moved from place to place. Eventually, they capped at Rehedim, but they had no water there for the people to drink. So once more, the people complained. Note that, once more. The people complained against Moses. Give us water to drink, they demanded. Quiet, Moses replied. Why are you complaining against me? And why are you testing the Lord? They were moaning. Paul references to the fact that they're doing a lot of moaning. Numbers, Numbers, chapter 11, verses 1 to 2. Soon the people began to complain about their hardship and the Lord heard everything they said. Then the Lord's anger blazed against them and he sent a fire to range among them and destroyed some of the people in the outskirts of the camp. Then the people screamed to Moses for help and he prayed to the Lord and the fire stopped. 
How do you feel about moaning now? It's interesting, isn't it? Numbers 14, verse 6. And we'll come to this in a moment, but I just want to note this. Two of the men who had explored the land, Joseph, J- Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jehovah, tore their clothing. Well, why did they do that? We're going to keep checking now because that keeps going. 29 in the same chapter, chapter 14, verses 29 to 30. You will all drop dead in this wilderness because you complained against me. Every one of you who is 20 years old or older was included in the registration will die. You will not enter and occupy the land I swore to give you. The only exceptions will be Caleb, son of son of Jephthah, and Joshua, son of Nun. Complaining, you moaned. That's it. And then Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 to 9. Then the people of Israel set out from Mount Hor, taking the road to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people grew impatient with the long journey. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And they began to speak against God and Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die here in the wilderness, they complained. There is nothing to eat here, nothing to drink, and we hate this horrible manner. So the Lord sent poisonous snakes among the people, and many were bitten and died. So let's just look at the Israelites just for a moment and see if we can learn something for ourselves. They were in slavery as a people for hundreds of years crying out to God to save them, yes? To get them released from these oppressive Egyptians. So God sends Moses. After a few plagues, they're released. Yay, praise the Lord. They start making their way, doing really well. Then the Egyptians come after them. They're running. Get to something known as the Red Sea. It's fairly large. The clue's in the name. Sea. Panic. Can't get across. Start moaning. What happens? Redemption occurs. God parts the sea. They go across to the other side. We know the story. Egyptians get in there. Sea crashes down on them. But that imagery of going through the water, going through the sea, is an imagery of baptism. Going from a place of being in slavery and enslaved and being captured to going through the waters to the other side to where you are now set free and you're baptised in Moses. As such, do you see the, the link? So they're now free because now they're on their way to the promised land they have been redeemed from slavery they're now on their way to the promised land no different from you and I if you're in Christ you've been set free from the slavery to sin you've been baptized you are now free you're baptized in Jesus and you're on your way to the promised land we all are we're on the journey But they're going across a wilderness. But they're being clearly guided by both a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. God. And they were going to this promised land and they know that they were going to a place flowing with milk and honey. They knew that their end destination was going to be good. But they had to go through some wilderness first. But along the way in this wilderness, they were provided for supernatural, as we said. The food was provided every day for them. The soles of their their shoes didn't wear out. They were provided for supernaturally. Unfortunately, they got lost in idol worship. They're an impatient bunch. Moses is up the mountain for a long period of time. 
Let's make a golden calf, shall we? Haven't quite got the patience. They start indulging in sexual immorality. They tested God. They grumbled about their lot before God. We just read a whole load of that. And Paul says in verse 11 in Corinthians, these are real examples of God dealing with his people and it's a warning to us. So as I said, we've been set free. We've been through our Red Sea. I know if you've been baptised here, it's not exactly the Red Sea. It takes two and a half hours to fill, not a few millennia. But in a spiritual way, you've all been set free, amen? We all know that we're going to a promised place, don't we, amen? But then sometimes it can feel like now we're walking in a bit of a wilderness. Yes? I mean, life's not exactly easy, is it, sometimes? We can feel a little bit like we're walking in the wilderness. Where are you, God? Yet our clouds... And our pillars of fire happen to be the Bible and the Holy Spirit living in each and every one of us. God is more with us now, closer to us, than he was with the Israelites. Because he's living in you. And we know we're on our way to the promised land, but we're not quite there yet. But along the way, do we get lost in idol worship because we get bored or we think God's abandoned us or it's not quite fully all there yet do we indulge in sexual immorality do you test God do you grumble at him about your lot now it's a bit hard as again blanket teaching it's not very easy when each person has their own individual pastoral situation because there's time we've got a right to just let it all out and be real and honest with God about how we're feeling. But I think with the Israelites, the fact that what they were doing, they weren't just complaining to God. They were harking back to what they wanted in their moaning all the time. At least in Egypt, we had food. At least in Egypt, we had roofs over our heads. You can imagine the moaning, can't you? You've just been crying to me to set you free from that. I've done it. And now all you're doing is whining and you want to go back there. And I think maybe some of our complaints are, oh, yeah, my life was so much easier when I wasn't a Christian. That's the same sort of harking back. Oh, life was so much easier when I didn't know Jesus. I didn't care then. Don't panic. You was on your road to destruction and death. Don't worry about that. It's a minor DL. Sometimes I think we forget so lose sight of the promised land And that's what the Israelites did. They lost sight of where they were going, that they just kept remembering, well, at least we had, it may not have been great. To use an old phrase that gets used, it was almost like better better the devil you know. Well, you get known really, really well if you don't remain in Christ and you haven't found him. If you now know him, don't be harking back to those days. Don't complain and grumble. God does take complacency seriously. The Israelites got relaxed. The Corinthian church were getting more and more relaxed in their walk with him. They were presuming upon God's grace. I've got a story that I can tell you going back many, many years, a very short one. Uh, a friend of mine back then, I remember we were all going out for the, uh, for the night and yes, we were going out for the night and it was going to involve uh, being in a, in, a, in a local inn. And uh, this particular uh, Christian friend of mine at the time turned around and said, oh, I can't wait to go out and absolutely get wasted tonight. Talking, drinking, lots of alcohol. Get really, really drunk. And I remember this, and I'm not putting myself as Mr. Self-Righteous Man here, but I remember turning around to this person and saying, but that's not what God wants us to do, is go out and get drunk. Ah, that's all right. God will forgive me tomorrow. You laugh, 
But that can be the presumption of presuming on God's grace. So all right, God will forgive me tomorrow. It's all right, I can do that. God's going to forgive me. Well, we just read examples of where God says, don't presume upon my grace to that point. Now, I also want to say this. In 1 Corinthians 10 verse 5, Paul is stating that their bodies were scattered in the wilderness and it's only Joshua and Caleb out of the original generation that went through the Red Sea actually made it to the promised land. Have you noted that, by the way? The only two out of the original generation that got out of Egypt out of slavery was Caleb and Joshua. Not even Moses got there. Now, at this point, we start thinking, oh, does that mean that we can lose the salvation? No. He's talking about a wilderness. He's not talking about the eternal destination. It's very, very different. Paul makes no reference to actually what happened to them in the salvational. Now, we know that Moses made it to heaven. Because why? Because he was in the transfiguration of Jesus, was he not? So there's your example. So this is not about loss of salvation. It's about running the race well. Okay? So, verses 12 to 13, though. If you think you are standing strong, be careful not to fall. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful... He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. It's a warning to the super spiritual, those who think they are beyond certain temptations. Or testings is a better rendition. Their knowledge they think will save them and allow them to avoid certain testings. But we're all tempted and tested with many different trials. And there are times that sometimes it can seem too much to bear. There appears to be no way out of this one. Yes? I might as well just cave into it. Paul is saying, well, God never gives you something that he doesn't give you a way out. Think about the Israelites approaching the big red. Egyptians behind them. That's it. They're getting recaptured again, aren't they? There's no way out. Looks impossible, doesn't it? God parts the sea. I bet they weren't expecting that one. I know I wouldn't have been. God always has a way out when you are tempted or when you are tested. Now... He is here talking about, obviously, part of that connection, if you remember, is about being invited to people's parties and eating idle food. And if somebody puts it in front of you and says, oh, this has been sacrificed to an idol, hmm, how do I get out of this without offending my host? Paul's saying, well, God's always got a way. God's always got a way. Don't stress. God sometimes always has a way. God does not leave us abandoned. Temptations come our way, he gives us the chance to get out of it, doesn't he? If we listen to him, if we're guided by him. I know, I would rather have a nice big pillar of smoke during the day and a massive pillar of fire at night. Make my life so much easier, I feel. I know exactly where I'm going. Wouldn't you? But don't forget, it's not about knowing about God, it's about knowing God. So your relationship with him and the spirit living in you will guide you. Problem is, we just need to learn to, well, it's not just trust, it's this. We Christians are very good doing a lot of talking. We ain't very good at doing a lot of listening. Verses 14 to 22. So, he says, my dear friends, and note the affection, my dear friends. He's not having a go at them. He's trying to help them. Stop being complacent. I hope you're not feeling how to go at right now. I hope you're getting this sense of, 
So let me do that. My dear friends, flee from the worship of idols. You are reasonable people. You're reasonable people, aren't you, here this morning? Some of you didn't sound too sure. Decide for yourselves if what I am saying is true. When we bless, when we bless the cup of the Lord's table, aren't we sharing in the blood of Christ? And when we break the bread, aren't we sharing in the body of Christ? And though we are many, we eat, all eat from one loaf of bread, showing that we are one body. Think about the people of Israel. When they united by eating the sacrifices at the altar, what am I trying to say? Uh, no, do you know, every time I come to that question, what am I trying to say? I go, yeah, Paul, what are you trying to say? Am I saying that food sacrificed to idols has some significance or that idols are real gods? No, not at all. I am saying that these sacrifices are offered to demons, not to God. And I don't want you to participate with demons. You cannot drink from the cup of the Lord and from, from the cup of demons too. You cannot eat at the Lord's table and act at the, Lord, at the table of demons too. What? Do we dare to rouse the Lord's jealousy? Do you think you are stronger than he is? Flee from idols. Rely on God, not idols. That's the main point of the chapters 8 to 10, is actually fleeing from idols. And Paul's using the commun what we call the communion table imagery, the Last Supper imagery, to help us understand what's really going on when you eat food known, that's in capital letters, known to be sacrificed to idols. He's talking to the Corinthians. When we're taking communion here at Greenford Baptist Church, we very much believe that it's for the journey, the spiritual journey, don't we? I know in some denominations, they, almost, they believe that the bread and the wine actually turns to Christ's body and, and real blood as it enters the body. But we believe more that it is actually about the spiritual reality behind taking that bread. That's why we say we take it together as one body. It's about strength for the journey. There's a spiritual reality behind when we take communion. And we know that, uh, that for Jesus, it's the new covenant and it's written on our hearts. And for Moses, it was written on stone tablets, the covenant. And what Paul is doing is saying, listen, this physical food that you think you can just eat... Yes, I know that it's the Lord's and everything in it, but actually for him, there's a spiritual reality behind that food. It's not just neutral. There is something that has happened. The idols might well be just physical, and you're right, they're just made of wood and stone and don't mean anything. But actually the spirit behind them is demonic. So when you're eating this food sacrificed to idols, you're taking part in something at a demon's table. You've got to understand something, because this is talking about going to patrons. Remember they wanted to go up the social scale and they would get an invite sent to them? Well, normally these days, when you get an invite, like come to the party or come to the wedding of so-and-so and Mr. and Mrs. something, isn't it? You know exactly whose wedding or whose party you're going to, yes? The same happened back then. Actually, what they'll say in the letter, they'll say, come to party or to dine from the table of this deity. So the invite would actually state the, 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 the deity to whom you are taking. So they would have sacrificed the party food. That's going to make you look at your volavons and your, your party snacks a little bit different, isn't it now? But this food's been sacrificed to this particular deity, deity. You're coming to eat from this deity's table. So if you turn up as a Corinthian Christian and eat that food, ah, oh, it's okay, they'll eat that food. They talk about they believe in this one God, but they're quite happy to eat from the dinner of another God. And Paul's saying you can't do both. It's sending all the wrong signals, basically, for a starter. It's not exactly doing much for the gospel. So where you thought you knew better, 
You don't. You can't drink from both. You're giving, becoming complacent. You think you can start getting away with doing almost whatever you want to do. And it's not just about eating food at a dinner party. It was about their whole lifestyle was starting to be a little bit lax and a little bit of, oh, it won't matter. Verse 23, 11 to 1. You say I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. You say I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. Don't be concerned for your own good, but for the good of others. So, and this is where Paul now goes to ethical teaching a bit more and says, well, this is what in practice you can do. So you may eat any meat that is sold in the marketplace without raising a questions of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. If someone who isn't a believer asks you home for dinner, accept the invitation if you want to. Eat whatever is offered to you without raising questions of conscience. But suppose someone tells you this meat was offered to an idol. Don't eat it out of consideration for the conscience of the one who told you. It might not be a matter of conscience for you, but it is for the other person. For why should my freedom be limited by what someone else thinks? If I can thank God for the food and enjoy it, why should I be condemned for eating it? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Don't give offence to Jews or Gentiles or the Church of God. I too try to please everyone in everything I do. I don't just do what is best for me. I do what is best for others so that many may be saved and you should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. Paul is quoting back at the Corinthians about the fact that they are supposedly free to do anything. Yes, but not everything is beneficial. And it's not beneficial about them. It's about the person who's in the room with them. Just because you know you're free to eat this food and it's not going to cause you any problem, it will cause a problem to the person who's in the room with you. Be they a weak-minded Christian who's not quite fully mature yet and haven't quite understood it's okay, or be it the person who's a non-Christian who just sees you eating that and you're eating that food from that idol's table. So when you then talk to them that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life and no one comes to God except through him... They're going to say, well, that can't be true because you're quite happy to eat the food off of this deity. Do you see the difference? And this word beneficial that is in the NIV, or here it's, um, sorry, in the NLT, this version that it's, uh, that I'm not allowed to do anything, but everything is, Sorry, not everything is good for you or what everything, not everything is beneficial for you, to you. The better rendition of that beneficial, which now I've just lost my line, that's really helpful, isn't it? Is better described as not everything is edifying. Edifying is actually the better word there. Oh, yeah, you're free to do anything, but not everything is edifying. Just because you're free to do something doesn't mean it's always edifying. So you might be free to eat that idle food. That's not a problem. But the person across from you may not be edified by your actions. They may not be built up in their walk with you because of your actions. It's not about you. It's about who's in the room. Because the Corinthians quote is that we are free, and so therefore then the demons can't touch us. But he's saying, yeah, I agree with you, because everything is in the Lord's and everything in it. And you could take idle food and re-bless it in the name of the Lord, amen? You know, if you bought the food from the marketplace, you didn't know where it come from, you should be giving thanks anyway. If you go to somebody's house and they've just given you food, fantastic, you give thanks, didn't you? Unless, of course, it's awful. I'm joking. Just make sure you're all awake still. 
But if somebody's actually said to you, this food is offered to this, you're going to think, well, that's to a demon. For their conscience, I need to refuse to have it. Now, how does that apply to today? How does that apply today? Because we discussed one version, halal meat, didn't we? And there's always signs in shops everywhere. But the question is, what is the halal meat and which isn't? Because not all of it's going to be. Maybe. I'm thinking of a kebab shop. Bear with me for a moment. Donna kebab that sits on the skittle thing. Spike and does all the turning. I watched a program once and how they made that. It didn't put me off. It should have done. <laughs> but I'm curious to know, seeing how that comes together, how that could have been sacrificed correctly. Now, you're going to have to go away and research it for yourself. I cannot give you that answer, to be honest with you. But I can't quite see how they sacrificed all those bits and blessing it in the way that they do that we described last week. But then again, would it be right, say, for me to walk into a shop like that in my clerical collar and eat the meat? Do you want the honest truth? I don't know the answer yet. I'm still battling with it. Do you know, we learn as well as we read the Bible and each new thing. I've got to say, I've been pulled up with this and gone, hmm, I need to go away and consider this quite heavily. But then again, I don't want to offend my next door neighbours or anybody I know who might don't know Jesus yet. And I need to go and visit with them and be with them and spend time with them. But if they say to me, this has been I don't know, sacrificed to so-and-so God, whatever God that is, whether they be from any other religion, I might have to sit there and say, thank you, but no thank you. For the sake of their conscience, not for the sake of mine. Because I know the Lord made it happen. It's really the Lord's food. Do you see the point? It's that constant fight or battle we have within our minds day in, day out, because it's not about us. It's about them. And if you love them, you're going to try and do the very best you can for them. But God will always find you a way out. For me, as I've said, the whole of the Corinthian letter is the, wrapped up in this one verse. Verse 31. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Jesus came down not for his glory, but for the glory of the Father. So that we could have a relationship with him. That's why Paul ends it. Imitate me as I imitate Christ who denied himself everything so that we could have everything. For me, there are three, three key questions I should ask myself every day. The main ethics out of these. Does my actions build up another brother or sister? What I do, does it build up somebody else in the room? Or does my actions further the kingdom of God? Or does it hinder it? Are my actions about getting my rights? Or are they about the rights of others? If you meet with me pastorally, you'll always hear me sometimes when you're not trying to make decisions you don't know. My question always is, what is God saying? When we get that first, what is God saying? Everything else will pan out. So part two. It's about God's kingdom, not about you. Think about the people in the room with you. Do what's best for them, as Christ has already done what's best for them. Let's pray. Lord, as Paul wrote so well, what am I trying to say? Lord, we're always asking, what are you saying? What do you want us to do? 
first and foremost, Lord, I know that you don't want us to get so wrapped up in this that we don't think of anything else. Can I eat that food? Can't I eat that food? You want us to listen to you, flee from idols, whatever our idols are, and run the race for you, focused on you. And Lord, I pray for that each and every one of us, that as we walk out of here, we're focused on what is your kingdom about? What is it you want us to do for your glory? Not for our glory. I pray that all of us will have a deeper relationship with you this week. In the name of Jesus. Amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.